Kuti. I'm the current chair of the British Hip Society Education Committee. Uh, and I welcome you to our uh, uh, Global Reach webinar series. Today, we partner with the Indian Arthroplasty Association, uh, who have an extensive uh, experience on treating ankylosing spondylitis uh, and hip replacement in such patients. So we have a, an excellent uh, lineup of speakers with uh, fantastic experience in this field. So I pass on to Dominic Meek, our president, followed by Ronan Roy, who is the president of the Indian Arthroplasty Association, to say a few words. Well, just to thank you very much, Satish, and for organizing this. This is the second one in the Global Reach uh, webinars. And I'm really looking forward to being educated and learning from my uh, colleagues in India about ankylosing spondylitis. Um, so really, that's, um, that's great. And I shall pass over to, uh, to them. Well, thank you, thank you, Dominic. And uh, on behalf of the Indian Arthroplasty Association, I'd like to say it's an honor to be teaming up with you all again for the second webinar. And uh, we've got a galaxy of stars uh, this evening for you, and uh, they'll be discussing uh, ankylosing spondylitis. And uh, as the talk, talks progress, you will see that we're looking at covering conventional and looking at taking spinal pelvic deformities into consideration, and finally the application of robotics. So we'll be looking forward to an exciting evening, and I hand it over to the moderator to take it forward. Thank you, Ron, and thank you, Dominic. I now pass on to Mrinal who, Sharma, who is my co-moderator, and he's going to introduce the speakers and their various talks. Uh, please keep your questions coming through the chat box. We will take them at the end. And we'll have an, uh, we hope to have an excellent discussion on this matter as we complete the talks. Mrinal, over to you. Thank you, Satish, and thank you, British Hepatoplasty Association, uh, for giving us this opportunity to collaborate with you all. Uh, we have uh, tried to cover ankylosing spondylitis in three aspects. The conventional way of doing total hepatoplasty, a total hepatoplasty in ankylosing spondylitis using the spinopelvic parameters, and how uh, you can use them well with the robotics. So we have a galaxy of uh, presenters here. Uh, our past president, Dr. Rajiv Sharma, um, of uh, past president of IA, is going to give us you know, the lecture on total hepatoplasty in ang spons using the conventional methods. Then we'll have Dr. Vijay Bose, who is going to present on total hepatoplasty in ang spons using spinopelvic parameters and how he adjusts for them during his surgery. And the third talk is going to be none other than Adarsh, who is doing a lot of robotic hips, and he's going to speak on ang spons using the robotic with you know, covering the pelvic spinal pelvic parameters into consideration. So over to you, Dr. Rajiv, for the first presentation. Thank you, Mrinal. Uh, thank you, uh, British uh, Hip Society, uh, Dominique and Satish. Uh, thanks, Ronan, for giving this opportunity. And my, my mandate today is to speak on uh, total hip arthroplasty in ankylosing spondylitis, the conventional way. Indications for the total hip arthroplasty in ankylosing spondylitis, as has been widely accepted, is that not just for the pain relief, but also for the restriction of the day-to-day -day activities, even in the absence of pain. There are multiple challenges in these cases, which differ from case to case, a uh, number of joints involved, both hips or having the fibrous ankylosis of both the knees, uh, the bony fusion or the fibrous ankylosis, what kind of anesthesia to be given, what position on the table, surgical approach, which one to be chosen, and the assessment of the pelvic tilt and spinal mobility. The planning issues are whether to do it simultaneously on both the hips or in the stages, whether the stages should be staged at three days or at three months. If the hip and knee both are involved on both the side, both the extremities, then one side hip and knee to be done and the next extremity can be done at a gap of three days or three months and that we will be discussing, I'm sure that in the panel discussion today. The cemented or the cementless implants to be used, it has been uh, widely uh, written in the, in the literature, accepted that cementless, cementless implants are also uh, good for good to use in ankylosing spondylitis cases. What surgical approach to be chosen? A standard posture approach or the dual approach for difficult cases or the transtrochanteric approach or the direct lateral or interlateral approach. 
the release of the soft tissues is always a useful uh, technique uh, ileosoas and subcutaneous adductor tenotomies it helps in checking the position of the acetabular and the femoral components in a freely mobile hip and also it improves the post operative range of motion the surgery is very simple to be done uh, before the total hip arthroplasty incision is given and then the uh, depending upon with the patient is having a flexion deformity then the anterior release if the adduction deformity then the adductor tenotomy a standard posture approach in most of my cases the ideal location of the incision lies over the mid axis of the femur laterally and curves posteriorly by approximately 20 degrees at the tip of the trochanter usually in these fused hips it is not easy to reach the hip and one has to be very careful especially for the injury to the sciatic nerve but with the care and and careful dissection it is not very difficult to see the dual approach is used for cases which are having the uh, difficult exposure especially for the cases where you have a hip ankylosis in abduction and in external rotation heterotopic bone to be removed first the neck is cut in c2 uh, in fused ankylosis fused hips uh, segmental resection is better care must be taken to avoid too proximal or too distal cut soft tissue releases to be done capsular release and one has to be careful that when you are doing the capsular release the care to the to avoid injury to the artery is very important uh, start reaming the remaining femoral head assessment of orientation of the reaming depending upon the transacetabular ligament and the assessment of the pelvic tilt while reaming is important care points are injury to the artery avoid over reaming or operative fractures impingement and malorientation the the neck is cut in c2 in infused hips especially the bony ankylosis segmental resection is better if you have the sufficient length of the bone uh, of the neck visible care must be taken to avoid too proximal or distal cut the, the one must prevent the injury to the trochanter and the posterior acetabular wall the use of the saw is useful but one has to be careful that the saw is is the use for the for the initial cutting and then after the completion of the osteotomy with the osteotomes adequate exposure is very important to decrease the injury to the atrophied and weakened abductors sometimes because of the uh, the too weak abductor advancement to improve the stability is important in some cases reaming of the acetabulum should be done without uh, removing the femoral head one can just uh, use the uh, counter rotation technique avoid over reaming of the osteoporotic acetabulum the depth measurement at the bottom is a very useful tool and usually if you leave about a about 8 to 10 mm of the medial wall i think it's a, it's a good idea to avoid over reaming of the acetabulum original joint plane located by the foveal soft tissue and incomplete gray ossifying cartilage even in the uh, bony ankylosis usually it is not too difficult to find out the uh, the true uh, floor of the acetabulum importance of adequate exposure is uh, is uh, not much to be explained it has to be you have to have a 360 degree view of the acetabulum to have a, a good fixation use the one pin superiorly one homens retractor anterior at the anterior superior wall of the acetabulum one homens retractor at the uh, tear drop and one posterior retractor and usually these uh, four things are enough to give you a very good exposure to the cup treatment of the osteophytes is important especially the anterior osteophytes and using the high speed burr is a very useful technique you use the high speed burr keep using the saline over it to avoid the heat uh, injury Uh, and then use the curved osteotomes to remove the osteophytes because sometimes in these ankylosing spondylitis cases there are huge amount of large osteophytes which are visible and which have to be removed and uh, uh, managed in time and the osteophyte can be used and then use the nibbler to take out the excess uh, uh, osteophytes post osteophytes can be left in in, in place if if needed the position of the cup antiversion of the cup is confirmed with the indication of the transverse acetabular ligament and the long axis of the body and spinal pelvic mobility and the acetabular cup placement we will be discussing uh, by by vijay and then after by adarsh the femoral component 
one must maintain the maximum neck, neck length and the offset because the lengthening of the limb that had been shortened by the original disease and by the fusion procedure. Better mechanical advantage for the weak abductors, additional stability of, uh, uh, by, for, of reduction under the maximum muscle tension is, is much more useful. Uncemented stem is preferable in my hands, modular component for restoring the hip mechanics and improving the stability. While preparing the proximal femur, one has to be careful to prevent the fracture of the trochanter. One must be careful to, to avoid the injury to the abductors, which are already weak in all these cases, and watch for a crack in the proximal femur. And gradually increasing the size of the brooch, one has to be careful that the final brooch should be having the good fixation if you're using a cementless implant and you, it, you must see by the toggling rotational movements of the, of the brooch that the brooch is stable in the medullary canal and there is no rotational movement possible in these cases. Check for soft tissue tension, impingement, stability and combined antiversion. In all other cases is very important. One example where you have the bamboo spine, hips ankylose in extension, both hips, sacroiliac joints and spine are fused and hips are having the spontaneous bony fusion in extension. We can see that the, the x-rays, the anesthesia used in this patient was general position on the table lateral, surgical approach was posterior and, and in this patient, the whole spine was fused. That's what we can see here. Post-operative, on the left hip, we use the anatomical head uh, the, the, the delta motion uh, uh, implant uh, on the right side, we use the ceramic on poly implant, cementless, the result at three months and at six months, having the good function, patient was still uh, trying to develop the abductor, abductor strength and we see that the patient is having an excellent function at the, at the period of six months. And the same patient at nine years, having the having regained almost a good strength of the abductors and all the muscles around the hip joint. Another patient where you have the bilateral hip involvement, stiff spine, fibrous ankylosis, but the correctable position of the pelvis, that's what you see in, in two pelvic x-rays. Here it was very interesting to find where we went for the surgery for the patient, patient had intractable back pain. And the tuberculosis in these patients, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, is not a not a uh, uh, uncommon situation. One has to be careful, and we realize that this patient had the tuberculosis at the dorsal 11 and 12 vertebrae. The patient was given a treatment of six months by anti-tubercular treatments, and then after this, the simultaneous bilateral total hip was done. That's for this patient at one year, an anti-tubercular treatment was continued for a period of 18 months. At two years post-operative, the cox spine was healed completely and patient was still kept on TNF alpha blockers for the intractable back pain, and which, is, which is found to be very useful in this particular patient. Another patient, bilateral hip involved, some hip movement preserved, spine not fused. We can see that there is some amount of function is possible in the hip joints, both the hip joints. The results at two and a half months, at six years, having the excellent function of both the hips. Another patient, bilateral hip involvement, fibrous ankylose, hips, spine fused in flexion, result by cementless uh, uh, total hip arthroplasty on both the sides, result at five years. A very unusual situation, I've kept it specifically because this, this position is almost uh, very, very rare, where the bony fusion was done in 90 degree abduction and fusion in 60 degrees of external rotation, giving a very difficult situation to operate. The exposure was done with a dual approach with trochanteric osteotomy, and that's what the patient's uh, final result was. The problems in these patients are hydrogenic fracture, overrim acetabulum, insufficient bone contact for cup, component loosening, heterotopic ossification for which the prophylaxis has to be given by endomethacin and sometimes the radiotherapy, impingement, and the vascular injury should not be forgotten at all. It has been shown by, by various literatures that the complication rate in ankylosing spondylitis is much more as compared to the control. Methotrexate and sulfur helps in peripheral arthritis, but not in these. 
spinal arthritis. The first line of treatment is NSAIDs, and if they fail, TNF alpha blockers, which are the newer, newer medicines, are very useful. And if the anti-TNF fail, the IL-17 inhibitors are useful, and which are available in, in India these days. One patient of bilateral hip, sacroiliac joints, spine fused, spontaneous fusion, inflection. Patient was walking almost on the hands for a long time. This patient was operated long back, uh, having the, uh, the surgery of both the hips first and then both the knees. It's kept here specifically to show that the overreaming of the esterbulum on the right side was a problem and one has to be careful in such situations. That's the patient at a year's follow-up and then after at seven year follow-up, the patient is still kept uh, closely in the follow-up. Another patient with this failed cemented cup came for the reason acetabular loosening in six years. And this patient was used with the trochanteric osteotomy and a hybrid total hip arthroplasty implant. That's the patients at the five-year post-revision surgery. Another patient where the cup loosening in three years only, the 2005 operated failed cemented cup leaving a large medial defect. And in this patient, in 2005, the octopus cage was used with the auto eyelid allografts. Bone substitutes were used simultaneously to reconstruct the estabulum. And that's what the uh, surgical pictures, and that's the result of the patient. And the seven year follow up of the same patient. We must remember that the arterial injury would be a major issue and it needs to be avoided at all costs. I'll conclude saying that careful pre-operative planning is important. Ensure availability of suitable implants for operative fractures to be avoided. Care to avoid over-reaming of the estabulum. Capsular release close to the rim of estabulum to avoid vascular injury and cemented or cementless implants as per the choice of the patient. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for an excellent presentation. Uh, we'll take the questions later, Satish. Yeah. Yes. So, yes, that's correct. Uh, let, At the end. Let, let me invite Dr. Vijay Bose. He is a big name in Indian hip arthroplasty and he has many implants uh, designs to his name. Uh, invite him for his presentation on total hip arthroplasty and spond using the spinopelvic parameters and how he reproduces them intraoperatively. Over to you, Dr. Vijay. Uh, thanks, Vrinal. Uh, uh, thanks to Satish and Dominic and the British Hip Society for inviting me. It's truly a pleasure for me to participate in this webinar. I'll share my screen. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So my task today is to uh, to show you how we use the spinal pelvic parameters into consideration when we operate on angst spawn. Very common pathology next to avian. The most common pathology that we encounter today here in this part of the world is angst spawn. So I'll be talking a bit about uh, the Navi Swiss, uh, which is the hip navigation system that we are using currently, and uh, others should be talking about the. Um, uh, robotics but uh, the thing is uh, the real point is not to you know not to make a point that you need expensive technology but what we really what we learn from this technology and how we apply it in day to day practice that's what really the core is all about so this patient you can see has got bilateral fused hips he's got a very uh, uh, gross spinal deformity as well so the question is what to do so don't worry, I'm not going to you know, bore you with this, all these complex cases. So today I'm going to just uh, stick to the very basics of how we do it so that everyone can understand uh, how we apply these spinal pelvic parameters. So spinal pelvic parameters is an esoteric science in that you know, all these conferences and webinars we find, we talk hours and hours on, uh, on, these, uh, on this particular topic, which is currently the sort of the hot favorite. But when you ask any surgeon, how do they apply? They just say in any angst spawn, I would just give a little bit of antiversion. That's the final message. That means they have not understood what's happening. And it's only the faculty that keeps talking about this uh, uh, spinal pelvic parameter. So today we want to sort of uh, uh, simplify the whole thing so that everyone can apply that. So that would be my, my task today. Now, also I'd like to say that this concept of just giving a little bit uh, less antiversion is a very flawed concept. And uh, some patients you in agglomerating spondylitis, you may actually have to increase the antiversion. So please don't go by the opinion that in angst spawn, you just give a little bit of less antiversion and everything will be fine. Certainly not. So the, the problem really is today is we have looked only at the AP X-rays for so long. You know, imagine a knee uh, arthritis. And if we ask someone to comment only on the AP X-rays, we won't comment on that because you need to see the lateral view. Similarly, 
uh, hips, you must learn to look at the lateral views. Once you start looking at the lateral views, then it sort of becomes uh, very um, apparent of what's happening. So once we don't, if you don't look at the lateral view, that's where all the problem comes from. So we're very familiar with AP views. They're very, very unfamiliar with. So the first thing to about spinal pelvic parameters, you must do sort of routinely these uh, lateral views of the hip and the pelvis, and then everything will fall into place. Now, defining coronal and sagittal deformities, we are all very familiar with pelvic obliquity. Uh, everyone can recognize that. However, we are not very uh, confident in recognizing pelvic tilt, which is nothing but the same kind of deformity that's occurring in the other plane, which is now the sagittal plane. And the, and the pelvis moves uh, one way or the other. And it is, it is, it is just, the, uh, like, just like the obliquity in the coronal plane, the tilt is in the sagittal plane. So that's all there is to the, the uh, deformities. Now, the, the, taking that uh, point further, now, when you talk about component placement, now, if, if you have a patient with a fixed pelvic obliquity, there are two axes that we all know. One, you can either the trans uh, iliac crest axis or the trans uh, teardrop axis will give you the actual tilt when you compare it to the, when you angle between that and the horizontal. So you can't put the cup either anatomically, in which case you'll find that you will put it uh, with reference to the uh, trans um, iliac crest line. Whereas if you want to put in a functional position, you do it uh, based on the horizontal axis. So that everyone knows, and that's very simple for us to follow. Exactly the same thing that we are going to do in the other plane as well now. So here we have, uh, so um, uh, so this is the, uh, the spinal parameters as, as far as pelvic obliquity goes, it's very simple. And the first thing that we want to establish in pelvic obliquity is whether this obliquity is going to be fixed or not. For that, we need to get lateral bending films, right and lateral spinal uh, bending films, know it's fixed or not. And uh, if it is fixed, then we are going to go by the horizontal axis to be as a reference point because it's not going to correct post-op. However, if it is mobile, then we are going to use an anatomical axis, which will be the inter teardrop axis, and that will uh, give us a functional plane. So the same thing we're going to apply now with the uh, pelvic tilt. So pelvic tilt is nothing but a line joining from the midpoint of the sacrum to the midpoint of the hip joint or the socket. Uh, or the femoral head. So that tells you what is the, the, the tilt in the sagittal plane. Now, just like the obliquity, it's a horizontal relation to the horizontal plane. The pelvic tilt is always in relation to the vertical plane. So that's what really the, the tilt is all about. There's one more plane that we must know about. There's the anterior pelvic plane, which is the line joining the anterior superior neck spine with the pubic crest. And that will give you the anatomical plane. Whereas your vertical line would be the functional plane. So it's very, as when you start comparing it to obliquity, things really fall into place. So cup placement in relation to APP would be anatomical placement. Cup placement in relation to vertical axis would be the functional placement. And so those are the two important concepts that we need to understand. Now, how do we know the, just like the pelvic obliquity, we had to establish whether this spinal deformity is fixed or mobile. For that, we need to get sitting and standing films and that we make out whether it is fixed or not. So if it is fixed, then we would go with the functional plane as regards to the sagittal axis. And if it is mobile, that means it's going to correct post-op, then you would use the anatomical plane or, the, or relation to the APP. So those are the basics. Now, three is spinal pelvic, there are hundreds of spinal pelvic parameters, but three are most commonly talked about in all conferences. One is the pelvic incidence, pelvic tilt, and pelvic slope. And for all practical purposes, you can uh, sort of disregard the pelvic incidence. Pelvic incidence is important only for spinal surgeons. Depending on whether you have a high pelvic incidence or a low pelvic incidence, the spinal surgeon will decide whether they need to, whenever they're doing a spinal fusion, whether they have to fuse it in lordosis or in kyphosis. So as hip surgeon, as British Hip Society, that webinar today, we can for all practical purposes disregard pelvic incidence. That leaves us only two parameters, the pelvic tilt and the second. We already covered pelvic tilt and we'll cover a little bit about sacral slope. Sacral slope, as we say, it is the S1, the plane of the S1 in relation to the horizontal plane. That's just the sacral slope. Now, when you're standing, the sacral slope is quite large. It's about 50 degrees. And when we sit down, there's a posterior pelvic tilt by which the sacral slope becomes 30 degrees. You can see in this diagram how there's a posterior pelvic tilt and uh, from standing to sitting, it reduces from 50 to 30 degrees. Now, pelvic tilt we already covered, line joining the midpoint of the sacrum to the midpoint of the hip joint in relation to the vertical that we have. And as from standing to sitting, the pelvis tilts posteriorly and you can see how the pelvic tilt increases quite significantly from uh, standing to sitting. So from standing, the pelvic uh, tilt is about 10 degrees, uh, sort of an average, and, uh, and sitting it's about 25 degrees would be the pelvic tilt, sort of the average. So the important sort of uh, uh, rule of thumb is that the pelvic tilt is a surrogate marker of anti -wash. 
So also you can see these uh, values are very familiar to us, 10 to uh, 25 degrees. Now here's the first case example. Here's a patient with the pelvic obliquity will deal first. And you can see that quite significant pelvic. We want to make out whether this, uh, this uh, spine is fixed or not. For that, we knew right and lateral fins. And this particular patient, the spinal deformity was quite fixed. Therefore, we need to uh, put this cup in a functional position. And that's what we have done. We're not put anatomically, which would have been very open because the patient is not going to correct post-op. So we used a functional plane to, correct, to place this cup for this uh, uh, pelvic obliquity. Now, when you come to sagittal deformities, the first thing to recognize in the AP view is your operator foramen. Dr. Ranavad has described very well the cat size. So when the cat size is normal, as you can see, the we all know how the operator foramen looks normally. That's a normal cat size. That means there's no sagittal abnormality. You don't need to do any special x-rays. However, when the cat size is open or operator foramen is very elongated, superior inferiorly, that means there's a lumbar kyphos and we may have to give some compensation. The reverse is when you find that the cat size is very closed or the operator foramen is like split-like or not seen. That means there's an exaggerated lumbar lordosis. So this is the uh, how we recognize that we need to do something more than just you know putting the cup blindly. So this is a very good uh, picture to show how when you find there's a pelvic tilt, the antiversion changes. So you can see the to your left, you see there's a lot of antiversion you can see in the cup. Although the cup is already placed, if you the pelvis tilts, you can see how the antiversion changes quite significantly. So it's very easy to understand this diagram how the pelvic uh, tilt would influence antiversion. So we really have to know how it influences. So once we start looking at the lateral views, you can see in this patient from standing to sitting, you can see that the uh, if you saw a, a line that joining the uh, on the socket with relation to the horizontal, you'll find 27 degrees and sitting it becomes two degrees. So you can standing to sitting, you can see it's, it's opening up. This is, a, this is a lateral view, not the AP view. So the measuring the inclination on the lateral view, you can see that uh, is known as anti-inclination. So just like how we would uh, measure uh, the inclination in the AP view, if you measure the same thing in a lateral view, it's anti-inclination and is an indicator of the cup antiversion. So we had to know the exact relationship. So which is basically for every one degree increase in posterior pelvic tilt, the increase in antiversion is 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 degrees. So that's all there is to it. So we have covered all the theory behind that. So from this, we have to answer three questions by looking at these parameters. Is, this, is the lumbosacral spine fixed or mobile? If fixed, which position is it fixed? If stuck, what compensation to give for in every particular case that you are looking at? When you say compensation in the sagittal plane, what you are really implying is how am I going to change the combined antiversion for this patient? That's what you're going to get. And there are three ways to do it, which we'll cover. So here's a case example. Here's a patient. You can see he's got ankylosing spondylitis. He's got uh, very stiff hips. And here you can see from standing to sitting two films, a lateral uh, hip and uh, spine films. The standing sacral slope is 40, sitting is zero, and you find that the pelvic tilt is 16 standing, and the pelvic tilt is 54. That means there's a very mobile spine. So although this patient has got ankylosing spondylitis, you must not give any compensation. So uh, some people say it's 10 degrees, some people say it's 15 degrees, but when the change is less than 10 or 15 degrees, only then it's a stiff spine, and only then you have to, you have to give compensation. Otherwise, you should not be giving compensation. So in this particular case, no compensation must be given, and we have just put the cup as in any other case, no compensation has been given. Now here's case two. Here you find that the sacral slope is 38 and the and, and, and standing and sitting is 36. That means hardly any movement. And the pelvic tilt, there's only two degree difference between standing and sitting. That means the spine is fixed and you got to give a compensation for this patient. Now we're going to find out how is this patient, answering question number two, how is it fixed? Now you can see that these parameters, the patient there, you can find that the sacral slope is, uh, is on the as how it'd be sitting. We say it's from 50 to 30. So it's very close to 30. So it's like a sitting parameter. Sacral slope is like a sitting parameter. The pelvic tilt, again, is close to 25. So it's like a sitting parameter. So both the sacral slope and the pelvic tilt are sitting parameters. So therefore, we call this as stuck in sitting. So now we have found out that this patient has got a stiff spine and is stuck in sitting. And therefore, we need to reduce the combined antiversion. The goal in this patient is to reduce the combined antiversion. So how do we go about it? If you have, you can use a you know, simple uh, you know, cell phone and measure the combined antiversion like the shown in this diagram. And then you can either change the socket portion, socket version, you can change the stem version, or you can change both to reduce the combined version. Or if you don't have that ability, then you can use a stem with a version of freedom like SROM or a cone Wagner, and then you'll be able to give a, a less combined version. Now, this is the Navis system that we use now. You can see that how we are marking the functional pelvic plane. These are these pelvic tags, and we're showing to the navigation system 
what is going to be the functional pelvic plane. And based on that, you can see that uh, if you, even if you don't have a system, you can draw a line, which basically is a plumb line with the patient lateral position. That is the uh, functional pelvic plane. And uh, because we don't have any measurement of the antiversion, you can use a fixed point of inclination and actually measure the antiversion as a length. If I have time, I'll cover this later on. So this is how we now document what is the antiversion in, in so many millimeters so that we put a value on whatever that we're doing. So the combined antiversion in this patient has been brought down to 20 degrees based on the spinal pelvic parameters. So this functional pelvic pain has been well described and this is a, a paper from Germany which describes the lateral decubitus patient position and how you take the functional uh, pelvic plane into account. So here's another example of a uh, patient. You can see again, the pelvic parameters are very similar to the previous one. The patient is stuck in sitting and uh, there's the, this is, uh, you know, Raju showed a lot of x-rays. They're quite disabled. And uh, once you get the, um, apply the spinal pelvic parameters and put your socket in the right position, you get a very functional result. So in conclusion, I'd like to say angst point is very common in Asia. It's the second most commonest indication for arthroplasty, hip arthroplasty. Assessment of spinal pelvic parameters is absolutely critical. Please don't go under the opinion that for angst point patients, you just reduce the antiversion a little bit and all problems are solved. Certainly not solved. We need to look at and start doing lateral films so that you get an understanding of what's happening in the sagittal plane. Understanding and application of concepts are more important than having access to expensive technology. I, we all we have access to robotics, but I always feel that 90 to 95% of what the robot achieves, you can do with simple, uh, no cost, uh, uh, you know, gadgets or in a very simple that you, everyone has access to. And only the last five, 10 percent that the robotic or the navigation will add. So all these concepts are important rather than expensive technology. In 2023, we must put a number on all variables, whether hip, knee or shoulder arthroplasty. We cannot say just increase antiversion a little bit, just decrease the inclination a little bit. I, I don't think we should accept that anymore. Every parameter in arthroplasty from, uh, you know, uh, these days, must come with a number. And once you start putting numbers, you become very, very accurate. So that's the thing. Thank you for the opportunity again. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. Uh, we'll have definitely some interesting questions on your talk. Uh, let's invite Adarsh on his, uh, you know, experience on robotics in Angspot. That's going to be interesting. And how he uses the spinal pelvic parameters. Yeah, very good evening to everyone. Uh, let me just uh, put this in a presentation. Yeah. So uh, I would like to thank uh, the British Hip Society and the Indian Arthroplasty Association for inviting me here today. I'm following up two beautiful talks by Rajiv sir and uh, Vijay sir. And I've learned so much from both of them. And this is some technology which has come to just help us more. It, you need to know all the basics. Otherwise, you're not even going to understand the role of robotics in this. So just a brief, uh, as you all know, it's an inflammatory disease that affects the axial skeleton and uh, it, uh, hip involvement is very common. Prevalence of hip involvement is 30, 24 to 36% and it leads to fusion. And in Southeast Asia, the prevalence rate uh, of a fused hip is between 0 0.18 to 0.54%, which is still quite a big amount. So as mentioned earlier by both the speakers, in healthy individuals, the lumbar spine is flexible in the sagittal plane. The pelvis tilts posteriorly to accommodate the hip inflection hip flexion when moving from standing to sitting. So in summation, when you sit, the pelvis will tilt posteriorly. That's one thing that you just should all just remember. This now with the robot, we can see what happens if the hip moves and the pelvis doesn't. It shows us where the impingement may happen. You can see over this over here, there's an impingement happening now between this bone and this bone. And this is what happens if the hip keeps on flexing without the pelvis moving at all. So you can see that this bone is impinging over here. So this is a bit of information that we now have with this new technology. So ankylosing spondylitis, we're talking about two different things. One, two things may be uh, there in each patient. One is a stiff spine and one is a fused hip. And both these things together will give a technically difficult THR. So we'll be discussing about how the robot helps in both of these um, technically difficult situations. So that, as you all, uh, as mentioned by Vijay sir also, the latest discussion point in THR, now, all these discussions have become old hat. It's all about the THR and stiff spine. So again, pelvic translation effect from standing to sitting. When you sit, the pelvis tilts posteriorly. That's what's supposed to happen. People with a spinal pelvic pathology who undergo THR have an increased risk of dislocation. And recently, the hip spine classification system has come up with a simple and effective way to identify patients at an increased risk of dislocation. It's by Dr. Vigdorchik, and this is the paper 
you can all uh, check it out it's a very good paper and he has summarized the four different types of um, spinopelvic association so he proposed the hip spine classification in 2021 he categorized patients for total hip arthroplasty based on spinal mobility and the hip range of motion it's widely used to guide surgery and implant design for thr in patients now so the, just a bit some uh, summarization of the paper he said there are two spinal issues that affect the pelvic position in thr that is spinal deformity and the stiffness as vijay sir had alluded to the flexible spine allows a posterior tilt when transitioning from standing to sitting <clears throat> but a stiff lumbar spine limits the pelvic tilt adjustment affecting the hip flexion when sitting inadequate component positioning can lead to prosthetic impingement which leads to dislocation or bony impingement thr for patients with spinal stiffness or deformity it's safe with proper pre op planning based on the classification and remember we are looking for modified antiversion inclination targets that is called as functional placement we are not always going to look for 20 degrees of antiversion and 40 degrees of inclination anymore so just again the the classification depends on these four parameters so first you look at the alignment of the spine is it a normal alignment or a spinal deformity so normal alignment means the pelvic incidence minus lumbar lordosis should be less than 10 degrees and a spinal deformity means the pelvis incidence minus lumbar lordosis should be more than 10 degrees not going to go too much into depth but if you just remember these calculations so again in a normal alignment you can have a normal mobility of the hip of the spine or a stiff spine so the delta ss means the difference between the sacral slope in standing and sitting position if it's more than 10 degrees it's normal mobility so this class is 1a normal alignment normal mobility is 1a normal alignment with a stiff spine of a delta less than 10 degrees is 1b with spinal deformity with a normal mobility is 2a and stiff spine with a uh, spinal deformity is 2b this is how we has classified uh, how we do each particular uh, case with 1a we have a normal inclination of 40 20 with 1b we try to increase it a bit 45 to 25 uh the if you come to the main one which uh, the one that we see regularly is stuck in sitting position as shown by dr vijay sir usually they say you reduce the component target should be less than the native anatomy or inclination so now we have all these variables cup size femur size height depth rotation antiversion inclination all these things have been made easy with the robo and now even stiff spine has been made easy with the robot just a brief workflow so this is a ct based robot it's a ct based robot so you can do the pre operative planning then you place the landmarks place the arrays then you uh, do something known as a registration of the acetabulum and the femur where you are corroborating the real time bone to the ct scan which has been taken then the robot also helps in reaming and cup impaction finally the femoral preparation trial reduction and you get reduction results as well this is a brief overlook of the workflow so implant planning you can use it for the acetabulum you can use it for the femoral antiversion and the size as well and you also can see the pre operative visualization of the post op x ray so now we've moved from 2d manual planning to 3d model based planning you can uh, you mean you get a 3d reconstruction of the each patient's bones and you get a pre op limb length assessment as well you know whether you are 3 mm shorter versus the opposite hip and how your offset is decreased compared to the opposite hip you also get a pre op visualization of what your implants would look like um then you can plan the acetabular component placement in the transverse the sagittal and the coronal planes and you can also determine whether you want inclination as 40 degrees and version as 20 degrees you can also restore the center of rotation if you see the pink dot over here is the native center of rotation the green dot is where your cup will be the center of your cup will be after implantation this is another view now with the maco point 4.0 this is a new upgrade for the software you have something known as functional hip positioning where you can adjust your acetabulum and your femur depending on your virtual range of motion which i'll show you in the next few slides you can now in include your pelvic tilts this feature allows the user to plan the placement of the cup based on each patient's pelvic tilt or sacral slope you can either use the sacral slope or the pelvic tilt as your parameters it allows the user to modify the cup inclination and cup version for that particular patient's um uh, pelvic tilts so this is what it looks like as you can see as you know already that the the pelvis will tilt normally but sometimes in a stiff spine and a stiff hip it will not so each person's lateral x rays are taken in standing and sitting we calculate the sacral slope with standing and sitting we enter these values into the robo both standing and sitting so it knows how stiff that particular spine is and then we check our virtual range of motion 
And then we determine whether we really want to go ahead with a regular 40, 20, or whether we want to change it. Then we go for the femoral component sizing and offset adjustment can be done. So you can even tell us what the femoral antiversion is. So we know the combined antiversion. So it adds together your femoral antiversion and your, uh, your cup antiversion, gives you what your combined antiversion is or whether you're within your range or not. This is something called as virtual range of motion. Once you've entered your values, you can go through complete range of motion in sitting position first, it will tell you whether you're going to impinge in this position of 40, 25, whether impinging or not. See 100 degrees of flexion, this person is fine. But once you start internal rotating this patient, he's absolutely okay. Then he starts to impinge at around 40 degrees. What about standing? Standing also the same thing. If you see this patient is in 40, 25 degrees, 40 inclination, 25 antiversion. And once you start external rotating, it starts to impinge over here. So what do we do in this particular situation? We reduce the antiversion and see what happens. And you can see that the impingement goes away. So now you're actually changing your antiversion and inclination as per your uh, sacral stroke values. Of course, you get a pre-op visualization of the post-op X-ray. And after the planning, all this planning is done. It also is going to help us in actually executing our reaming. So earlier we have sequential reaming with the manual THR with incremental reaming followed by trialing of the cup. But now with the robotics, we ream the astabulum only once and implant the final prosthesis. And this also helps in bone preservation. So this, if you see over here, uh, down here, you can see I'm putting the reamer in and on the screen, the green part is where we need to remove. We have a conical haptic. So you still have the freedom to move your robotic arm around. And it's going to let me remove only the bone, which is required to be removed. And once that's done, it's a single ream. I can impact my cup. So it also tells me how much, yeah, lock it. how much depth I need to go. If you see over here, I'm banging the cup in and you see this distance remaining over here. It is going to tell me how much further I need to go in. It says I'm eight proud and now I'm two proud and I'm one proud. So now I'm in, I don't have to go any further. Otherwise I may shatter the quadrilateral plate. It also lets me check what my final values are. Let's say this one was planned as 4020. We got a 3922. It, it gives us all this information as well. So let's go through a case. It's an uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis case where we had a stem version of 20 degrees because it is quite an uh, antiverted stem. When we went through our range of motion, it showed there was a lot of impingement on a regular 4020 on a standing. So when we tried to ex extend and external rotate our hip, it was impinging on the cup. So what we did was reduced our antiversion 12 degrees. We usually in a conventional case, we don't tend to put our antiversion in 12. We get very panicky about that. But here we managed to bring it down to 12 degrees and reduce the impingement. Went through a good range of motion. Our combined antiversion is still within our range. So we went ahead and we implanted it. We got 4111 as, as opposed to 4012 planned. And we got a great hip with a very uh, stable hip. Another, ex, another patient, if you see this pre-op x-ray, he has a few sacroiliac joints, bilateral arthritic of hips inflammatory arthritis. If you see the, the delta in standing and sitting is only 6.9 degrees. Between standing and sitting, there's only a difference of 6.9. That means it is a stuck, it is a stiff spine and it's less than 30 in both standing and sitting. So this means it is stiff and stuck in sitting. So this is type 2B. So in general, we normally say that in type 2B, we have to reduce the antiversion of the cup. That's what we have learned all these in all the previous slides. But let's look at the other parameters over here. So it has showed us, so we've done the planning. We've got the right size of the cup. We initially put as a 4020, but then, and if you see in this 4020, there's no impingement in standing and sitting position. But what happened is when we saw the femoral antiversion, it, it was a retroverted femur. So it is a paradox. We, what do we do here? Do we increase our antiversion of the cup or do we reduce it because of the uh, 2B stuck sitting? So we went through, we entered the values of the sacral slope, standing and sitting. Then we found that the robot is telling us that we're impinging at 4020. So we actually increased the antiversion of the cup. If you see over here, we increased to 25 and we got rid of the impingement and we, we got a beautiful hip, a nice steady hip, stable hip. We did put in a dual mobility just to be safe. That's always a safe bet. And we got a great hip. So now let's go to the next part of the dilemma, which is the fused hip. So normally a CT based robot has to segment the, uh, all the CT scan films, and they come together and create a 3D model of that particular patient. Then the segmentation is done on the femur. And again, the same segmentation is repeated on the astabulum. And that's when we go ahead with the planning and the execution. But when you have a fused hip, 
what we there's a bit of a change here what we do is we segment the whole the femur as well as the uh, pelvis together so as an n mass as an n block segmentation so the ct scans of the pelvis are performed as per the protocol but segmentation of the pelvis and the proximal femur should be performed n block together and the landmarks which are placed are adjusted in the pre plan such that the initial three astabular alignment points are now outside the astabulum usually the, the registration of the astabulum is within the astabulum but here we are trying to register it without dislocating it so what we do is we register outside as a single mass of bone and after we do that then we do a regular planning of the cup and the stem as we were earlier we can also do an in situ neck cut where we can just use the probe to tell us where the neck cut should be i'll just show you a quick video of that as well this is my case we just did last week where it's a stiff hip we put in the uh, uh, the trochantic array we use the probe and it's going to guide us if you see the screen up here it tells me where my line is i put my probe there and i use a cautery to mark it the same thing down here use my cautery to mark that place join them together and i take a cut which is in c2 cut okay and then you take the cut as we normally would then you go ahead with the remaining rest of the case so just quickly throw through through this case this is a right ankylosed hip pre op ct shows a completely fused hip we do a pre op planning for the components the acetabulum and we do an extra articular uh, registration of the points then in block reaming guidance so though then we use the uh, the cut as i mentioned earlier you do the neck cut in c2 and use the robot with this this is i've taken this case from uh, dr ashish singh and he has sent me this graciously across this case so you can see though it looks very odd on this picture down here we are able to ream out the head within the cup without having to take out the head and this is what it looks like so ream the way the head in c2 you get a beautiful bed over there we can again check you get a uh, inclination of 41 and 20 and diversion and a great post op x-ray as well this is our case um again uh, ankylosed left hip we did all our planning on the acetabulum we got a pre op visualization of the post op x-ray and at the end after all the planning we managed to get a nice stable hip as well we're doing a study we're evaluating the spinal pelvic parameters based on the sacral slope in indian patients and uh, we're taking all our patients and calculating our uh sacral slope values and we found that presently out of 72 patients 1a is 40 1b is 10 patients 2a is 16 and 2b is 6 we are we do have quite an increasing number of stuck in sitting position patients as well thank you so much thank you adarsh for an in depth review of robotics in ang spond especially those difficult cases which you're doing with the robotics and the ones which cannot be dislocated at all so that's a new insight into this concept uh satish will have some questions uh, yes we do have i think uh, some have been already answered by rajiv uh, but the the question to all is that the 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 suggestion that uncemented stems can be used cemented stems uh, or do they fail prematurely uh, we can start off with uh, since uh, rajiv has already answered let, let's go to vijay uh yeah thanks um well i think it's just your philosophy if you are uh, i don't think it fails prematurely and next one if you are happy cementing it i don't see a problem but generally in india we tend to do very young patients we don't do the primary osteoarthritis so we tend to go uh, stick to non cemented uh, stems as a philosophy and then we follow the same into ang spawn but having said that there are some ang spawn with very uh, like dorsi canals where i would i wouldn't hesitate to cement it but i think uh, ang spawn by itself doesn't change your i mean the choice of stem whatever is your philosophy in ang patients i think just follow the same okay thank you and to others yes i agree with vijay sir again all, most of our ang spawn patients are quite young at least less than 35 less than 40 for sure so we want that to last longer so we don't have much experience using cemented in these cases 99% of the time it's uncemented okay thank you uh, to follow up on that uh, especially in, when you really talked about combined antiversion to, to you wanted to increase antiversion in the femoral side uh, or changes with the version that's been suggested but you're using an ml taper stem how do you navigate that issue because you you struggle i because you have to go by a, a particular landmark you can't change the version in an ml taper type design type design unless you're using a uh, an srom or a wagner cone type of stem 
Uh, you're asking me, sir? Yes. Yeah. So yes. We, we are not changing the stem uh, uh, as for what we want. We are hitting in the stem as per the anatomy of that particular patient. And then we are just measuring the antiversion that it's giving us. It's giving us an idea of what that native antiversion is. So we are not changing the antiversion there. So according to that, we're changing the antiversion in the cup. It's the other way around, actually. Okay. So let me um, add to that. Uh, so the uh, the striker stem maybe is a blade stem, so maybe a little bit of a problem. But other non similar stem like the Korai, for example, uh, the Polar, for example, uh, you do have uh, you know a room to change it about ten degrees. Now ten degrees doesn't seem a lot, but the combined antiversion is thirty to thirty five degrees, so it's thirty three yeah. percent of uh, the total version there. So ten degrees is all that we are we are, we are interested in. Yeah. So most of the non similar stems would give you a leeway of changing about 10 degrees. It's also depending on where you want to start. So my tip would be, we'll assess what is the native femoral version before we, uh, as soon as we do the neck cut, and then the starting point on the, you know, the, the trochanteric region, we'd either take it posterior or anterior, depending on whether we want to increase or decrease the stem antiversion as the case uh, dictates. So like even that case which I showed where the uh, femoral antiversion is 20, that was the native version, it is quite antiverted. So I was just showing that we can measure the antiversion by using the robotic technology and then adjust in the cup if we need to. I, I have a question to all the three panelists. So how do you compensate for the spinopelvic core, uh, you know, parameters without uh, technology? So you using robotics, Dr. Vijay is using Navi Swiss, uh, Dr. Rajiv is doing it uh, by eyeballing probably. But I think if you are compensating something and you're calculating parameters and the degree of antiversion is being added, it cannot be done without use of technology. So do you advocate that angspawn patients should always have some benefit of any kind of technology interoperatively? What's your take on this, Dr. Rajiv? Uh, my feeling is that not, not necessarily that the technology will, will help you. Uh, I, I think experience uh, and in the surgery for, for a complex case like uh, callosing spondylitis, you have several uh, issues. It is not just the inclination and the uh, uh, of, of the cup. Uh, several issues, how you address the soft issues, how you address the, uh, the uh, glute, how you take care of the glutei, how you avoid the fractures, how you have the exposure, the proper exposure of the cup. And having said that, if you have everything available, then probably what is, uh, is right. What Vijay has also explained very well, that it is not necessarily that you have to have a robotic assistance. It is also sometimes the simple uh, understanding of the uh, of the spinopelvic uh, mobility uh, and the relationship with the uh, changing the antiversion or the abduction of the cup. I think that is what is more important. Um, may I ask Satish that uh, uh, you asked about the cemented and uncemented cups. And I, I know that uh, you guys are using mostly the cemented, uh, cemented stems. Uh, so what is your preference and what is your say on this? The, would you prefer a cemented or the cementless stem? in your setup? It's an, again, an individual philosophy. So in very young patients, I tend to go more on cemented. I think Dominic would wage in and say he probably more use cemented stem. So I, Dominic, you want to say something about that? I think you're on mute, Dr. Dominic. Well, I think a lot of the philosophy in the UK has been for the, the hybrid hip replacement, just in people who are used to cementing. Um, it has the versatility and you can control the version, the depth and the offset a little bit more easily, perhaps than the, the, the cementless ones. Um, we quite like the fact there's antibiotic in the cement as well. Um, so I think um, both used by the individual who's happy using them will know the nuances of that individual fixation and uh, they'll be able to compensate for it. And as you say, some of cementless stems do give you a little bit more wiggle room on setting the anti-version, uh, although particularly some of the, the collared ones may be something that people are looking at as well, just in terms of interoperative fractures as well. Um, but certainly for the UK, majority of people would tend to use a, a cemented stem. And I think both have good long-term results in inflammatory arthropathy. Uh, so I think they're reasonable for either to be used. Well, I have a question for uh, Adarsh and Vijay. I mean, when you're aiming for a functional placement. Yes, sir. Uh, does TAL become a secondary marker then? I mean, you're not really worried about TAL. Is that correct? Uh, 
Yeah, go on, go on, Arash. Go on, Arash. Yeah. Sorry. So I, I, we just keep joking that uh, the, the TAL has lost its importance. No, not really though, because you should always have it for future surgeries and all. But we do have a look at the TAL as well always. In fact, we're doing a study where while we're doing a robotic case, we're using our probe to check what the antiversion of the TAL is as well. I mean, what antiversion the native cup is in. So just so that we have an idea before we, we do our planning. So though the numbers are telling us that, okay, this is a good functional placement, we still do have a look at the TAL to make sure that we're not going too outside the native uh, an, uh, anatomy. The other question that I have is for all uh, Ron, three of Ronan, you. can I just Sorry. add you? Yeah. So as I explained in my talk, you know, if you, you had to first find out in Angspon, it's specific to Angspon, if the spine is fixed, then you must not go by the TAN. That's the whole point yeah. of this uh, webinar. Right. You must not go by the yeah. TAN. But if exactly. you have a mobile spine, that means the spinal deformity is secondary to your hip deformity and it's going to correct post-op, then you yeah. must go anatomically. The TAL is a very good uh, anatomical placement, one of the tools. Beverland has described that. But if you find the spine is fixed, and that's the whole idea of spinal parameters, if you work out that the spine is fixed, then you must not go anatomically. That's where the mistakes come from. I think that's probably one of the most important take-home messages uh, from this webinar, I think. Uh, Ronan, uh, uh, Vijay, will you agree with me that even if you use the technology or you decide, the, by the depending upon the spinopelvic mobility or the stiff spine, mm. that what kind of inclination you have decided to increase or reduce, the dial will help you to, to understand. One is the technology, but a counter check with the dial. Uh, that will also tell you that not necessarily that you have to keep it parallel to the to the tail. Definitely. But so, also, yeah. if you are changing the inclination, the tail will be an advantage that that yeah. you are reducing yeah. the inclination or increasing the inclination or anti yeah. Yes, the tail is the measure of your anatomical placement. You know, just like uh, pelvic yeah. obliquity you take. So yeah. uh, whether you want to go anatomically or you want to go functionally, you got to decide what is the based on your spinal pelvic parameters. And yes, and then uh, I'd go as far as to say you must not place it based on it. Trial is useful in that sense that if you are parallel to the trial, you're doing some mistake there. So you need to uh, give right. some correction. Right. You need to give some compensation. As a matter of interest, I'd like to ask all the panelists, uh, does anyone use radiotherapy or is everyone using endomethacin? Yeah, Dominic? I mean, um, well, um, if they've got previous history of heterotopic, I would tend to use radiotherapy, but um, I think just non-steroidals for, you know, standard inflammatory arthropathy like ankylosing spondylitis. What about uh, you, Satish? Yeah, same here. I, um, if there's a previous history, I I just go with endomethacin. I don't use radiotherapy. Uh, and if there's a history of, uh, of inflammatory arthropathy, then I would go with uh, uh, endomethacin. Rajiv? Uh, I use endomethacin only. No, no, no radiotherapy. Others? Same here. So endomethacin only. We haven't yeah. had any cases where we sent endomethacin. And Vijay? Uh, no radiotherapy, but any NSA is fine. It's not necessary. It has to be endomethacin. So I have another question to the panelists as well as uh, our co-moderators. Uh, what is your uh, threshold for using a dual approach in angspon cases? Where will you go only with your conventional posterior approach? Where would you choose going for an interior or a harding approach? And when would you choose a dual approach for such cases? Dr. Vijay, let's start with you. Yeah, so we used to use a dual approach, especially when you have a very stiff hip, a few stiff in external rotation. And then you find that you don't have access to do your neck osteotomy. And that is classically what we used to do earlier on. But then um, uh, we developed this technique of doing this uh, posterior trochanter reduction osteotomy. So we see the trochanter, the posterior uh, one-fifth doesn't have any muscular attachments. And once you take that uh, non-muscular uh, portion of the trochanter off, then you get very good access to the neck. And once we started doing that, we found almost, almost I would say, that we don't have any more necessary to go anterior as well. But uh, if need be, I wouldn't hesitate to go anterior to the gluteus medius. So that, that's the dual approach. So what about uh, hip fixed in external rotation and abduction? You still go with posterior approach? Yes. I mean, as I said, you know, so if you're not able to do that, we'll do a posterior approach, go anterior, do a neck osteotomy or a release, come back and do the... Uh, so in a complex case, you must, uh, all your, uh, you know, your steps must be very familiar. So you're a posterior surgeon and the most complex case, you don't go and do some different approach. That's a very wrong thing to do. So you need to come back to very familiar territory. That's very important, I think. I agree. Uh, Dr. Rajiv? 
uh, as I have shown uh, that the dual approach is for all the, those patients where the fusion is in external rotation, because there the, uh, the, uh, the accessing the neck posteriorly is difficult. So at least the neck cut should be done by the, by the dual approach using the anterior part of the dual approach. And in very complex cases, I try to do the trochanteric osteotomy uh, because that helps me in two things. One is that it is giving me the, uh, the good view of the surgical side. And also that you can, you can advance the uh, trochanter to increase the strength of the abductors. Dr. Dominic, you, you, which approach would you prefer? Um, I would try and do the posterior approach. It's, um... Satish, yours? Uh, same here. I'd stick to what I am very familiar with. So I would go with the posterior approach. And our experience is quite limited. We don't see such deformities. So it's very, very rarely that we come across such severe deformities. Okay. And what is the threshold of using a dual mobility? And all of you, you know, mm -hmm. when would you switch on to a dual mobility? You approached from both the approaches. You find the soft tissue is not good enough or your inclination is got not good. When would you switch to a dual mobility intraoperatively? Like uh, I mean, uh, others used others used robotics and still used a dual mobility. Yeah, that that particular case, yes. Uh, I had a double safety. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Vijay was saying something. Yeah. So um, I think my algorithm is very, um, very simple. So when I find that I'm able to give adequate compensation, but when we say, suppose we want to say, reduce the anti-version of the cup, the same time, we don't want to have the anterior edge overhanging. You see, that would cause eyeless was impingement and things like that. So you are constrained. Although we say, in principle, you can do that. To an extent, you can do that. But then when you cannot, or you find that the, the compensation you, you need, there's also something known as a, which I wanted to cover, but I didn't have time for that yet. So your zone of compatibility. For example, you want to reduce the uh, version significantly. You cannot bring it zero, for example, on the, on the established side or on the, on the femoral side. That'd be a disaster. So there's a zone of compatibility. So when you find that all these things don't work out within the narrow zone that you've got, then your bailout option is a dual mobility. Uh, for me, uh, Bernal, it is the dual mobility is a very limited option, uh, only in the cases where you are reducing the antiversion significantly. When you have a possibility of dislocation significant, otherwise, most of the cases, probably the uh, uh, normal cup uh, is good enough for me. I, I guess so, uh, sorry. sorry. If my sorry, just, um, uh, the cup size is much lower, if the head size is ending up be much like less than thirty to twenty eight head, then I would probably just think just to reduce the risk of dislocation, go for a dual mobility in an angst model. Uh, uh, Mrinal, can I just uh, take away point of this webinar? As uh, Ronan said, um, uh, you know this technology, experience technology is one thing. But I think, you know, the, the uh, era that we're living in, it's time to put numbers on anything. It could be as simple as uh, using a goniometer, using a ruler, but whatever parameter that you're using, that X-ray, you need to put numbers on it. I, I don't think from now on we can say I reduce the anti-version a little bit. So simple things like a digital inclinometer, a ruler, goniometer, uh, things like that. So whatever, whatever you're doing, you must put a value. Once you start putting values, you become very, very accurate, very close to technology. The, the, the problem that we had earlier on is we, we were not putting values. Once you may be accurate, maybe you need to, you know, uh, you know, calibrate that, whatever it is. But once you start putting numbers, you become very, very, very accurate. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Dr. Vijay. But at the same time, we all must understand that the soft tissue sleeve has not been answered with all these technologies. So we need to take care of a good soft tissue sleeve as well. Um, of course. Vijay, you showed uh, the picture where you had drew, drawn a line and you are measuring the distance. How do you calculate the angles from those distances? That's right, yeah. So basically, you know, the digital inclinometer gives you the inclination, so no problem at all. Yeah. It's as good as the Navi Swiss. Uh, so I have no problems with that. I have, uh, you know, calibrated with the Navi Swiss. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any digital instrument that will give you the version. So you got to put your, your trial cup inside, and then now we're trying to uh, see what is the angle between that uh, angle of your cup and your functional pelvic plane, which you have drawn. It's the same thing the Navis is used as well. You draw a plumb line of the spine, thoracic spine, plumb line it is, okay? Now, to fix that point from which you want to measure, uh, you, you use your digital inclinometer to make sure whatever angle of inclination of the cup is fixed. For example, you say we're shooting for, say, 35 degrees, okay? So, wherever the perpendicular to your functional pelvic plane meets your trial handle, 
at 35 degrees. So for all patients, it becomes constant. So you know that you have, now you got a, a, a numerical value. It may be five centimeters, six centimeters, whatever it is, but that's a measure of your antiversion. So we have reduced the antiversion to this plane. So once you start doing it and start measuring, then you know, even in a normal cases, this, this guy has got tremendous antiversion. This guy has got less antiversion. And once you get that concept, you, you know, you're, you're really refining your techniques. Did I make that clear, Satish? Did I make yeah, clear? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. So is it too simplistic to say that uh, in stuck standing, you, you increase the antiversion and uh, you're stuck sitting, you reduce the antiversion? As a general guideline, yes. But the question is how much you want to, uh, that again, you know, you need to work out how much you want to. But certainly uh, the take home point is if you do the wrong thing, for example, if it is stuck sitting and for whatever reason, the, the femur had a, then increased the combined antiversion, that's going to be a disaster for sure. But if you get exactly accurate, probably you'll escape. But if you err on the wrong side, that's really going to cause you problems. Thank you. Um, uh, to any final words, uh, because I think we've gone just over the hour and it's been in a very exciting discussion on uh, what's been a very important topic. Uh, st start off with uh, Dominic. Um, no, I, I, I just have to say I've had a fantastic time there. I've really enjoyed um, listening to all these uh, presentations and I think actually for once I understand spina pelvic. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ronan? Well, I thought it was, it was great as usual and uh, I just hope we can keep this up and look forward to collaborating again in the future. Yes, thank you. Ronald? Yeah, I think, um, Dr. Rajiv, you want to say something? No, no, after you. Okay. So I think uh, we've been to the point, everyone has given great presentations and used everything, whatever is available in the market and the uh, common sense also to get the hips right in position and the accuracy uh, for angst spawn patients. And I think uh, if we have technology, we should use it and we should use it uh, with the, you know, taking care of the soft tissue sleeve as well. So uh, there might be, you know, patients who wear probably just the eyeballing might work, but those maybe 2% where we can give them better results using technology it must be used. That is what I would say. Thank you. Uh, Rajiv? Uh, yeah, I wanted to say that uh, to our young surgeons who are here, uh, listening to us, uh, that what is very important is that the soft tissue sleeve, as Mandal has talked about, the exposure, the various other surgical uh, surgical uh, points, uh, which are very important, uh, should be should be the main focus of the surgical aspect. Uh, and also for that uh, limited number of patients where there is a, st a stuck standing or a stuck sitting position, probably that understanding should should help you. Uh, uh, as Vijay has rightly said, that at least you will not err on the wrong side. Like, like doing the, the wrong inclination in a stuck sitting is probably a bigger option, a bigger, bigger problem, and that can be avoided. But the basic surgical principles are very important. Thanks so much. Thank you. Vijay? Yeah, um, pleasure interacting with all you folks. I learned a lot as well. Um, so I think we have some key take-home points, and I hope that there's no more an esoteric science, uh, this uh, spinal pelvic parameters, and everybody starts using it in their day-to-day -day practice. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Adar? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity today. And uh, I absolutely agree with uh, what Dr. Rajiv sir has said. Uh, this, the robotics and the navigation and all these things help us, but it can definitely be done without it with a very good uh, feel. And that has to be learned first before we even try to think of uh, adopting ad robotics and technology. Because unless you know the basics, it's really difficult to implement the technology in that particular case. Thank you. Uh, personally, I've learned a lot. And thank you to Indian Arthroplasty Association, Brunal, uh, Ronan, uh, and uh, all the speakers. Uh, and uh, Dominic, thank you for the support. It's been a great webinar learning for, for me, at least. And I hope uh, those who have tuned in have learned. Uh, so on that note, uh, thank you, everyone, and bye-bye. Until next time. Thank, thank you. you.